and thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it, and we have the great pleasure tonight of having John Osborne with us, and he is the head of Calaveras County Office of Emergency Services, correct? Yes, sir. Thanks for what you do. Okay. I, know, uh, I know this is, you know, we've had way too many instances lately where your department is front and center on it, and uh, for those who don't know, tell us what's under your Bailey work. What's... Uh, what's uh, so the Office of Emergency Service, our primary mission during a time of a, of a countywide emergency yeah. is to help coordinate all of the teams uh, within the county that are doing their portion of the work. Uh, by that, you know, you say during a wildfire you have a, you know, fire response that they're trying to put out the flames. Right. We have a law enforcement uh, response where they're trying to evacuate and maintain the safety um, of the community. Um, you also have roles like the Department of Public Works that um, may need to do road closures or uh, road maintenance, emergency road maintenance. There's a lot of other departments that are involved in, like you say, a, a wildfire that you wouldn't traditionally think of. Right. And our role is to coordinate that support um, in, a, in a single effort to, to keep the uh, emergency at hand at the absolute minimum that we can. Got it. Um, post event is for your department. Are you kind of the lead person for the county for FEMA reimbursement or grants for for reconstruction? Is that does that run through? Is that your daily work as well for your department? So again, that's one of our coordination okay. roles. Is if there is um, there's short term recovery and long term recovery. Short term recovery means getting folks back to their homes, right. making sure that they have clean right. and safe water, clean yes. and safe power, um, that whatever destruction has taken place, that we mitigate the, the issues that come from you know, houses being burned down, um, electrical lines falling over, yes. and those kinds of things. That's yeah. the short term. And then after that is the long-term recovery. The long-term recovery includes uh, working with our state Cal OES partners and our federal FEMA partners to restore the community to uh, the the hole that it was before the incident took right. place. Right. And sometimes that, you know, there's there's multiple components of that. And the one that I probably want to recognize the most is um, some of the emotional um, recovery that needs to take place. Um, when I first arrived here in the county. Um, even though that it had been almost four years since the Butte fire. Yeah. The Butte fire was still very, very, very ingrained in our thinking process um, as a community. It still wasn't out yet. Yes. Yes, yeah. Um, and a question on that. I know this is a little bit from a, of a side question. Um, for the Butte fire area, you still see a lot of the dead sticks, you know, the, the dead standings. Is since the Butte, and I heard that they've mid, they're starting to change some of this up in the Tahoe area. Since the Butte, have there been new processes put in place as far as getting replanting done? Even is there more of a coordinated, even on private and public, to, to, for mitigation to make it visually visual recovery? So one of the things that you've seen um, probably from the Caldor fire and the Tamarack fire. Yeah is an awful lot of log trucks carrying yes, burned logs. quick. Quickly. Yes. Um, and, and that's critically important for a few different reasons. Number one, it gets that fuel out of the forest. The last thing that we need to do is have another incident right. Um, right. You know, the, that has the devastating power of a Caldor or a Butte or yes. a Tamarack fire. So getting that, that wood out of, out of the forest yeah. and, and recovering its usability is important. Um, the second thing is that it, it helps the, the land recover. Um, so it just doesn't become brush, right? Right. So you end up with just this sage, you just, you know, sagebrush and... This tinder box. Yeah, it's almost worse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, under, the understory is important to manage that. And from what I have seen over the past few years, um, those efforts are becoming more and more coordinated and more and more speedy. Right. Right. So basically, now there's a process to where you know, post-fire best practices are, are becoming a little more normalized? Y yes, sir. Okay. And, and an example of that is the work they did up Highway 50 from the Caldor fire. Right. You know, it took them an extra week or two 
leaving mm -hmm. Highway 50 closed, but they were able to move into that area, remove those trees that had been damaged, and we're now hazard trees. At some point, you know, there's going to be snowfall and strong wind yep. Yep. that's going to blow those trees down and, yep. and cause us more issues, right? Yeah. So while it was uncomfortable not to have Highway 50 open for another couple weeks, um, doing that work was really important uh, to the safe traveling public yes. later on. Yeah. Um, I guess the big question then is, uh, you know, everybody even tangentially related to it can talk, you know, this, this upcoming fire season, you know, it's uh, we're in another drought year, uh, we're coming into it. Um, yeah, you know, luckily and thankfully, but we have a lot of unburned fuel pockets. I mean, we, you know, we're and not saying we're due for another one, but we kind of are. You know, is it? The fuel levels um, are at um, peak season levels already. Already. Because of yes. the 66 or 7 days that we went yeah. without rain. Yeah. We had a great start in December, mm -hmm. um, and then we lost a lot of ground. Um, and that's unfortunate. We did get some rain this week. We're expected yep. some more this weekend, and we'll yep. take every bit that we can. Keep the moisture levels up a little bit. Yeah. That's right. So, you know, as a, as a resident um, and a community member, it's really important that we recognize that and take affirmative action um, to protect what's, what's ours. Yeah. And that's, you yeah. know, making sure that you have defensible space around your mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. that you're addressing um, home hardening with the proper roof vents and proper rafters being closed in, um, that you're using proper vegetation and that you're managing the vegetation around your home. Yeah. That 100 feet um, is often the difference between saving yes. a home and not. And on a good thing though, there's been so many fuels reduction projects and shaded fuel breaks. I and mean, you know, we're in a lot better shape as a county than we were pre-Butte, right? I mean, as far as... I believe that we are. Ways, um, yeah. And some of that is the leadership that we have in the county, from yeah. the local fire districts to our CAL FIRE um, partners in the Tuolumne yeah. Calaveras unit, to our federal partners such as the Stanislaus Forest, um, BLM, they all, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, um, those, those entities all play a role in that. And uh, there's a lot of very, very good projects being conducted throughout the county. There's the Murphy's Fuel Break. Yeah. Um, Sierra Pacific Industries has uh, multiple shaded fuel breaks on their on their property here in the yeah. county, um, and they do that all on their own. Um, go oh, good question is on the fuel breaks. I know in the past there's been always the battle between the clear cutting side and everything, but I think over the last ten years. There's been a consensus if people see one of those uh, fuel that looks like a, a bad hair plug type of thing, you know, is is the whole goal in those so people understand, isn't it? If if you have spacing so you can prevent crown to crown runs, isn't that the goal? I mean, you want it thin enough so that if fire goes into that section of the forest, that it's not just going to do endless crown runs, isn't that? That's that's one of the goals. Okay. Some of those goals include, you know, rearrangement of that fuel. It's not always feasible for us to remove all of the fuel. Right. So sometimes it's um, using uh, a masticator to take the fuel from that ladder fuel and put it and spread it out low on the ground where it's not going to burn right. and be able to go up into right. uh, the crowns. But it also affords us the opportunity to make uh, to make a stand at a particular place. Um, you know, those those fuel breaks. They're easily treated with um, with retardant right. um, ahead right. of time, and then hopefully that can slow the fire head down to the point where maybe it can be controlled at that place and save what's behind Which it. Which also helps the tankers because they have a nice delineated spot that they can just mud it down, right? Isn't that part of the... That's, yeah. that's part of it. it okay. and, and really what it does... Um, is it makes it safe for our firefighters, our personnel, to go to into make a line, huh? yeah to make a to make a stand yeah. for us and yeah. our communities, right? Um, you can't ask a firefighter to go into six foot tall brush and expect that they're going to be able to stop a fire, you know, especially with some of the the yeah. fuel models that we have. Yeah. Um, our our county is so diverse in the sense that we go from grassland up into heavy timber and, and everything literally in between, in between. right? Yeah. So those fuel models uh, make it difficult to adapt to the different environments. You can be fighting a fire in heavy timber one day and a grass fire the next, right? So having those fuel breaks available to them to make a, a good defense yeah. and keep it from one fuel type into another 
And we've been seeing important. fire behaviors that are unlike, I mean, there's no precedent for how fires behave now, right? Isn't that the pretty amazing? The, the, the fire behavior the last few seasons yeah. has been unprecedented. Um, our, our fire folks um, have uh, a, a, an immense tasking in front of them when it comes to fighting some of these yeah. you know, really heavy fueled fires. I remember you may have seen the video of it. I remember this is kind of one of the first of the of this new version of fires was when we had the rim fire. And there's some there's some footage of from some tankers. Um, I think they were the MAFS tankers who were working when they first started bringing those guys in, running mm -hmm. and they were running they were doing a, a load over on the rim fire as it was making a, it's a southward run towards Yosemite. And if people want to see a fire behavior that was, it was crazy because that was dense. It got into a grove as they were making their run and they were estimating that the flame wall was between three and 400 feet high because it was running through dense, full grown trees and you could just see the, the crowns explode ahead of it. And the, the, the pilots narration, not, you know, the, they weren't narrating it, just their instinctual response to the fire for that fire behavior was it's still worth watching because yeah. it was just a guttural you watched, I mean, it was The destruction is unprecedented. Yeah, and I mean, there was no you could see that there was no way any human could do anything to slow that down. And it was just making a run. And that's where those shaded fuel breaks play yeah. a, a big role yeah. because if we can get those flame lengths back down and stop the forward progress of that fire, at least slow it down yeah. to give us a, a fighting yeah. chance yeah. Um, and make it safe because you, you can't put no, fire folks there in front was nothing. of that, right? I mean, you could, no. you could see from that video, because it was they, they were coming up on it and you could watch the flame just, the trees explode ahead of that wall as it marched south. Yeah. And it was still to this day to me, it was just like, you look at that and it was like, Okay, that's what a forest fire can yes. do. You know, it was just, it was phenomenal. Yeah, it was it's mother almost nature. beyond beyond. It was, yeah. yeah. You watch that, and it's just like you watch a three to four hundred foot flame wall just marching. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah crazy. just marching, and it was um, okay. Um, a little bit of a switch on that is, let's say people we were coming up on fire season. We know PSPSs have been all the discussion and everything else. Um, They've been better at managing those as far as the, you know, instead of a broad swath, they're more surgical now. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, PG&E, uh, both here in our county and uh, within their service territory, yeah. has uh, spent a lot of time and effort to sectionalize um, the areas that face the greatest threat um, and have installed equipment um, to switch power so it doesn't cut that wide swath before. Right. Right. Um, and they have invested um, in a recovery process that is faster to turn the power back on. One of the things that a lot of folks don't necessarily realize is that once they turn off the power, they have to visually inspect every bit of that line yes. before they can turn it back on. Yes. Um, and they have over the past three seasons, I mean, we've only had three seasons mm -hmm. here in this area, um, that has become a more streamlined process and gotten right. faster right. Um, every season. Yeah, first season was just like, oh, really? It, it was, now, then it was first second, one was, was rough. Like, okay, last year, last year was like, oh, okay, we can. This is okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you know, some of our some of our communities, uh, especially in the upcountry, um, are adept at at surviving or um, living without power yes. and some of the more. Uh, nice amenities that we have, mm -hmm. um, and that shows. Um, and hopefully, our message is getting out to folks. You know that when there's a winter storm, that um, that you're prepared for it. Have yeah. extra fuel, extra yeah. food, extra medication. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you that can take you out can... a home loan to buy a fuel. Now yeah. is that the, is that a? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the fuel prices are uh, very uh, unprecedented as yes. well. Talk about fire behavior. Yes. Um, a question is, I don't know if you, um, if Comcast has been in touch with you, but we've seen, as far as mitigating the impact of the PSPSs and the other natural outages, we've seen Comcast do a lot of uh, upgrade their backup battery panels, you know, there to where instead of going from like a four-hour window 
because part of your job is communication, right? I yes. Mean, and I think it's hard to communicate with people that have no way to communicate. Right. And I think... Um, and so part of, part of uh, what we strive to do is to, um, to provide available avenues so that people can communicate. Yeah. Uh, you know, PG&E rolls out what they call the community resource centers. That's a place to charge your cell phone, to catch a Wi-Fi signal, yeah. um, catch something decent yes. to drink, um, and maybe a snack. Um, and those centers are really meant to kind of allow you to gather up and recharge and, and, and stay plugged in. Um, we use all kinds of different methods to try and communicate. You know, uh, our primary source of emergency communication is Calaveras Alert. Right. Um, and you have to opt into that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you can do is you can opt into the weather portion of it and receive weather warnings. Um, last year we actually had a blizzard warning. Right. Um, and it, our system is built so that if uh, the National Weather Service issues a blizzard warning for anywhere in the county, um, it actually pushes out that message, that, that National Weather Service message, directly to uh, the folks that have signed up right. through Calaveras. Alert. Right. So that heightens that awareness so you can be more prepared. And then, of course, uh, we have successfully used Calaveras Alert multiple times in, in my time here so far um, to alert residents and, and help get them out of harm's way. Yeah, yeah. So we do that. We also have a social media presence. Um, and social media is it's such a strange uh, animal because you hear people go, well, I don't have Facebook or I don't have Instagram or pick, pick whatever platform. Um, but they're talking about it so they know. Right. And that's the best part about social uh, yeah. media is yeah. it's very organic and grassroots in mm -hmm. nature. So hopefully our communities are talking to one another so yeah. that if someone that doesn't have Facebook yeah. is talking to someone that does, and yeah. that word is spread through yeah. a grassroots, yeah. you know, grassroots effort. We also communicate with traditional media um, like this today, yeah. um, our local papers, our local radio stations, um, and we're always looking for different ways to improve that process. Yeah. Um, one thing coming from a, the media side of it is if, is if there's any way to do, when you do the calories, you know, the, the alerts, if we could, on the media side, get an email every time one of those gets pushed, just so we may not be able to get them all up, but it would be nice to where it was you see where like okay that one needs to you know that one needs to hit the front page that one needs to hit the front page is that part of the yeah platform? that's part of what we do okay. is uh, you know we'll push out um, a, a companion press release yeah um, and we push that out through generally email yeah but we also share that on social media right um, and some of the traditional media outlets have become blended sure um, and yeah. pick that press release right off of, of Facebook or we have Instagram. as well yeah yeah we have um, and then that spreads that you know communication out even farther I still the only reason about the email is you know a lot of the old the media organizations still is is email is kind of your workflow that's you right. know that's you know the if if your work it's well that's a side issue to our little news thing here but you know our little uh, conversation here but um, sometimes for emails it's more of a, you know, it's a nice thing to, it's a workflow. Thing. Right. So, um, so as far as you're looking for this, this upcoming fire season, if, if people are, say, we have a lot of new residents in this area that have not been through a fire season before, um, what would you, what's your counsel to them? Say they're new to the area, they're, you know, they've come, they've come from the valley or the Bay Area to where the, you know, the, they may not understand the immediacy and the real danger of it yet. You know, what, what's, what's your counsel to that? So, um, number one, sign up for uh, Calaveras Alerts. It's on our, the county homepage. Okay. It's just a click away. You can select um, how it notifies you, whether it calls your cell phone first. I parking to age myself here. Your home phone first. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, your your email. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and you can you can create a hierarchy of how it how it uh, okay. notifies you. So you can choose the best avenue. Um, so that's that's number one. Number two is to um, understand that you know this isn't urban living. This is right. uh, this is wooey. This is wildlife wildfire urban interface yes um, so the threat model is very very different and yes. it is very very immediate 
And it also depends on your own set of circumstances. Um, if you have something that requires you to take longer to gather your things um, or arrange transportation, or um, my family, we have lots of animals, um, and not all of them are tame. Um, right. So understanding that, that that's going to take us longer to pack everybody up and right. get out. Right. So instead of maybe yes. at the warning stage, maybe that's my trigger to pack up and leave because by the time it takes me longer to load everything that I that is near and dear to me, yeah. um, by the time I get it all loaded, it's gonna potentially be an order and then I'm ready to go, right? right. If I wait till I get to the order and then I have a couple hours of gathering, gathering all the critters up, um, that puts me in a rough position yeah. um, and potentially um, a, a lethal position. Um, a question is, are you guys, um, we listened to an address by uh, Sheriff De Basilio a few days ago where they were uh, promoting the uh, evacuated badges. The, you know, do you, those, you have those through the county as well? Or most of your local firehouses have those? Is All of the, the local firehouses okay. have uh, the evacuation tags mm -hmm. um, as well as the sheriff's office. Um, as well as OES, yeah, um, and you can stop by. What we recommend is that you know, of course, you, we've, we talked about the critters and evacuating yep. early. Yep. Um, setting yourself up for success, having a go bag with you know a few days worth of medications, a few days worth of clothes, some decent food, yeah, some water, um, and have that in a in a go kit and ready to go. And then you take that um, that evacuation tag and you just put it on the handle of that. And then when you leave your residence, put that evacuation tag out on your gate closest to the road. Yeah. Um, and what that does for uh, our first responders, specifically our law enforcement officers, they see that tag that they, they know a couple things. Number one, that you're already gone. And number two, later on, after things have calmed down and they're trying to provide for everybody's security, yeah. that nobody should be around that house. Correct. So right. if they see yes. someone yes. looking around yes. and they see that tag, that actually helps them understand that, hey, maybe that guy's up to no good. Right. Um, right. So it helps us on the front end get people out faster because the first responders can now, instead of driving up that long driveway or making sure that everybody's gone, they can assume that people are and, and get to the people yes, that need help. And just to reinforce it for people who are new to the area is that increases the efficiency because in an evacuation, the sheriff's office, I mean, they have to do a door knock, so to speak, yes. and you know, uh, marching down these roads. And it, it increases their efficiency exponentially. If, yes. they can, if they can do a drive-by and see tag, 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 instead of having to stop at 20 houses, they stop at one. Or right? the, Isn't, the yeah. one that needs help versus the 10 that have, have self-evacuated. Right, yeah. right, right. That's I think exactly that's a right. real, I mean, but people as a white, you know, if they, it's, it, it increases their efficiency exponentially. Exponentially, yeah. yes, And I think that's a... Um, in working with, um, and I think since we've been in this fire era now, is coordination between all of our local fire districts, CAL FIRE, is, it, is some of that routed through your office? I mean, is it, or if, is it... Is it so there are different um, avenues that are routed through my office. Okay. Um, but we also um, support our first responders. We have nine different fire districts, local yep. fire districts um, in, our, in our county. Um, and they are, because they're neighbors, right, um, are pretty good at knowing their neighbors and knowing when they need help and, right. and providing right. that help um, right. in a, from a community basis, right? Um, our state partners, um, CAL FIRE, the TCU unit, is fabulous. Um, they are community-minded, um, they're professionals, and they act um, as, a great, um, as, as a great department that kind of helps everyone else along. Right. Um, right. Most of the area in the county is state responsibility area, um, so they really do a great job of squaring their shoulders to that load and, right. and getting right. the equipment and the people that, that are needed into an incident. And things that people, local residents, be, I mean, we're lucky in the fact that we've got an air attack base that's pretty close by. And, you know, I mean, if, you knew, and if you're following scanner stuff and everything else, you can tell now that, you know, most of these things, they launch, they launch everything before they know it's needed or not, right? I mean, That's typically, correct. typically, if you see a fire start uh, before 
you know, as the time the trucks get arrived on scene, there's usually something aerial overhead as well. You know, and and that is, um, you know, that is a uh, a function of Cal Fire, obviously, with the two yeah. tankers and yeah. uh, the new Firehawk helicopter, which yeah. is amazing. Um, that that really aids our initial attack. Um, those local responders. Working right. well with Cal Fire, working well with Cal Fire's air air um, assets to really get aggressive on a fire um, and put it out before it becomes a butte or right. a Caldor or a Tamarack. Um, a question on the Tamarack and the Caldor. Um, I know Forest Service manages fires differently. You know, I know in the in the past, but. Have they put? Have they made the rule permanent that during just drought season stuff that they are going to, like the tamarack? Unfortunately, was kind of the worst case scenario of the fires to where they it was basically like a quarter of an acre for like two weeks and then exploded. Um, have they have they changed their rules of engagement on initial fires until the drought? I mean, I, so that actually that order came down from uh, from the federal level yes. to the forest yeah. uh, during last season. Yeah. Um, and, you know, fire is just post Tamarack, right? Yeah. Isn't it? yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> fire fire is, is a part of the forest just as it's much as it. it's a good thing in some ways. It, it is. Yeah. Um, and that's why you see during the winter time, Right. Um, a lot of prescribed burning that gets done. Um, so that that fire can be used to manage right. the forest bed and manage the fuel load um, during the off season. Yeah. Um, so you know it's it's an important function um, to be able to uh, properly prescribe fire and and use fire as a tool to better manage our yeah. forests. Yeah. And I think that as the you know based on the last three years the conversation about. Um, using better tactics and using better practices has come to a point where now you're going to start seeing um, that come true, where uh, there's a lot more prescribed burning, there's there's a lot more fuel right. management that's going on. But they, but for this season, they are going to, they are going to put them out a little more than they would normally, isn't that, isn't that still, is that enforced for this upcoming season? As far season? as I know, but I can't speak for okay, the Okay, I thought forest, it was, yeah, I thought it was, because I think, for those of you who don't know, the Tamarack one, Forest Service, and I feel bad for them in some ways, but if they get a lot of pushback on this one, because there was video of them going over it and taking pictures of it and deciding not to do it, because if they would have just hooked up a bucket, I mean, there would have been no more, at I mean, they could have just hooked up a bucket because they were already over, I mean, they could have just put it out. I mean, it, that was the Tamarack one, unfortunately, was kind of the... And, you know, it's it's difficult, and um, fortunate. we are very blessed here in this county to have yep. um, professional foresters and professional fire management officers yep. Yep. Um, that were trying to make the best choices they could considering There's all no of the There's no perfect inputs. world. There, There's yeah. no perfect world. But the Tamarack one. Anyway, um, okay, we're down to our last two minutes, so thank you for joining us, thank and we appreciate welcome. it. And if you're gonna tie a bow on it, if you're talking to residents now, upcoming for you know OES stuff, give us the, you know, give us the summary. So the summary is, is understand that uh, your your personal safety is in your hands, right. um, and there are things that you can do to be prepared. There are things that you can do to to harden your home um, against all hazards, yeah. um, and be prepared to react to uh, whatever the hazard is proactively. Um, there's tons of information on our website about how to harden your home. Uh, since we talked mostly yeah. about fire, yeah, um, about how to build a kit, about having an evacuation plan. Um, a communications plan, um, and I would urge everyone to do that. Um, look at those documents and at least think about what you would do if you were faced with um, an emergency situation yeah. um, and how you're going to care for yourself and your loved ones. That includes, you know, obviously, your furry friends. Um, and last but probably most importantly is sign up for Calaveras Alert. Sounds good. Thank you, John. You're very Appreciate welcome. It. Thanks Thank for you. having me.